The following program contains distressing content covering graphic details of lynchings in America. Please proceed with caution. We can be as separate as the fingers, and all things essential in mutual progress, we can be as one as the hand. Accusing a man who is being lynched, who is being hung on a tree, uh, simply because he struggles vigorously against his lyncher, the victim is accused of violence. But the lyncher is never accused of violence. And I only point this out because I must be telling the truth when I, when I speak. That whenever a man goes to the courts, that he is abiding by the laws of the land, and that man who is willing to stand up with that decision is a brave man, regardless of what his beliefs might be. And it is because of our effort toward getting straight to the root that people oftentimes think we are dealing in hate. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. You can live almost anywhere if you fight to get in. You can enter almost any nightclub, you can enter almost any bar, and nothing will happen. But it almost means that there is a bar, there is a hotel, there is a doorman, there is an elevator boy, there is somebody every day. There is that one place you cannot go, which means you enter every door on edge. Hello, friends, and welcome to Freedom Speaks Podcast. I am your host, Craig Woodall. We explore many subjects and many issues so that freedom has a voice through you, our listeners. And now, here's our episode. All right now, well, it is our second episode on Freedom Speaks Podcast. I am your host, Craig Woodall. Happy to be bringing to you another episode uh, that we hope that you will enjoy. I wanted to start off first by recognizing a community that I'm a part of. It's called the Underdog Podcast Community on Facebook. I'm just so grateful that I've been able to be a part of that community and pick the brains of podcasters who are much more knowledgeable than I. Uh, And in doing so, I've also been exposed to or met a couple of other podcasters. And I wanted to mention uh, two people in particular, give a shout out to them for the information that they've given me, the engagement that we've had uh, directly. The first person is Kara Koslow. Kara Koslow has reached out to me and I reached out to her. And she has a podcast called uh, Murder Me a Little. It's a very nicely done podcast about Madeline Webb. It's, like I said, it's it's really nicely done, and I've enjoyed listening to uh, the episodes that she's put out so far. So if you have the opportunity, please give her uh, a listen and uh, support her as well. The other person is uh, Eric Lee. Uh, he is a an individual who has a podcast called This Is How We See It. And I have literally enjoyed listening to this podcast. I've probably listened to, I don't know, maybe half of the the episodes that they have. He is with a group of his friends or family, I believe, Ronnie V, Tanae, and Ms. C. Uh, And they do have a very nicely done family-type discussion. It's very funny. It's very refreshing. And so uh, please give those guys a listen as well. And I will continue to uh, support them uh, as I'm able to. So I just wanted to give them a shout out and uh, let them know that they have my support as well. I was born in Anderson, Indiana on November 25th, 1970. And I lived in Indiana off and on for about nine years of my life. I say off and on because after my mother and father divorced, which happened when I was about four, uh, maybe five years old, I lived with my mother, who had gone into the Navy, and literally one day she, I had been having some, or she had been having some disciplinary problems with me, and she asked me what my problem was, and I said I wanted to see my father. So that weekend, literally, I was living with my father. And I stayed there for a couple of years until uh, my mother asked for me again, But everything I remember about the town when I go back, and generally I go back to Anderson, Indiana, uh, when people pass or as a visit, because I've lived in Utah for, you know, now 28 years. I remember it being a a factory town, 
um, dealing with cars. Uh, my father worked at Del Corimi and re retired there. Uh, I remember near my grandmother's house was uh, you could hear race cars in the background all night long, very loud because she, she lived very near, very near the uh, racetrack. And I also remember basketball. Basketball is a big thing in, in Indiana. But like I said, I wasn't there for too many years of my life. And I do have some memories, of course, living with my father away from my sister and my mother. For example, I would remember that my father would have me be on the CB. That's the way he would communicate with me uh, in order to tell me the things that I need to do, my chores and those things while he was at work and I had come home from school. And I remember a couple of times when there was a tornado warning and he would call and, and give me instructions on how to open up all the windows and get in the bathtub. And of course it was a frightening situation for me, but uh, it was just kind of what I did. And the CB was a very fond memory. I, I remember picking the handle that I would use. I was super kid and, and uh, people would always, you know, my father would always relay that people enjoyed my banter on the phone or on the uh, CB. And keep in mind, this wasn't the time when we had um, cell phones, you know, I'm 50, nearly 50 years old, so um, we didn't have the type of communication that we have now. Above all, one thing that I remember is when my father was not at home, and I was, that no one was to come in the house. And there was at least one time I was sick at home and somebody came to bring me some food to eat because I was sick at home by myself. And I remember telling this person through the door that I couldn't let him in. They were trying to compel me to open the door, but like I said, my father was pretty specific about the rules and the instructions that we give me. So no matter what or who it was, they weren't coming in the door. Now my father has lived in Indiana, Anderson, Indiana specifically for all of his life. He has now for many years been the pastor of Friendship Missionary Baptist Church he doesn't like to fly. He's altophobic, so he's afraid of heights. As he puts it, unless he absolutely has to fly, he won't do it. So he makes time to travel. And my mother, on the other hand, she did enter the Navy and left Anderson, Indiana. But uh, she entered kind of late. It wasn't like she was like right out of high school. Um, and she only did 14 years. But And her siblings also, all of them left Anderson, Indiana. Now, like I said, even to this day, it's a town that is very familiar and very close-knit on some level. Everybody in Anderson, Indiana knows something about somebody else. And and uh, and maybe that just wasn't the thing for my parents, or at least my mother uh, and her siblings. But uh, they have all left Anderson, Indiana. Which brings me to uh, my grandmother. My grandmother was a very strict person. She raised her kids during an era where kids were... They only spoke when spoken to, and that passed down to us as we had the relationship that we had with our with my grandmother. I remember completely thinking in my mind that there was there really wasn't anything I could do at my grandmother's house uh, without asking, and so uh, it was just that strict kind of thing that um, you know my grandmother had and. Uh, you know, she wanted us to be polite. Of course, we did say the yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, to her extended. That was given, brought to us or passed on to us by my parents. When we came back from Japan, uh, my mother had some type of schooling that she needed to go to. And we had to live with my grandmother for probably like a semester. And I, you know, a semester of school. I think I was uh, came back when I was like 15. So like, like the ninth or 10th grade. We hadn't been around my grandmother for a very long time. And... It was as if we were these, you know, this time had passed and we were with this grandmother, my grandmother, who still thought of us in this space and time where we were very little and very young. So it was as if we were, you know, being told to do something or not to do something because, you know, as we were when we were little. But it was kind of like, um, you know, we weren't being disrespectful, but it was always something. And so I just remember having a conversation with my mother and it was like, you know, we're not really doing anything wrong, but, uh, you know, grandmother seems to be upset about this or that. So my grandmother, as I, as I indicated, she was a very, uh, she was intelligent, even though she, I don't think she graduated from high school, but uh, she was intelligent and witty and, and bright and 
and respectful. Anybody would have her stay over her house, and that was a thing for her. And you know, when you went to her house, everything was always in order. You had to cover things in the microwave and all those kind of things. So,、um, but what she did do was, and I think really she simply just had、uh, an understanding or a, a way to deal or work with white people, if you will. She was a nurse, and she she took care of people in their homes. And also in the hospital, but she also cleaned and cooked for them. So it was as if she was welcomed in, into this this environment of white people, if you will. And I say white people because the way my grandmother would put it, it it wasn't too many. There weren't too many black people that would, you know, pay for somebody to come and clean their house unless they were, you know, very wealthy. She had an understanding, if you will, at least from my the way that I could perceive of dealing with white people in a way that was not. Offensive or bad or whatever to to them,、um, but when my grandmother came and visited Utah to see her grandkids, my children, there was a time when her and I had time and we we traveled to、uh, Wendover, which is a a town that is about you know, you know an hour and a half, about 120 miles away from Salt Lake City, and it takes about like an hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes to get out there. As we were going out. Maybe about I don't know halfway there, I I was approaching a vehicle up in front. It was a white vehicle. I generally drive about five miles per hour over the speed limit, and as I was passing this car on the left hand side, my grandmother could see that it was a police officer. It was a it was a Utah Highway Patrol. She immediately became. Agitated or, or nervous, and she was like, "Grandson, you you can't pass that cop." All right, I, I don't think I, I don't think she used the word cop, but you know, she was telling me that I couldn't pass this cop. And in fact, I, I I discerned a fear in her voice. And my grandmother, I'm 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 only traveling five miles per hour over the speed limit. It's okay, you know, calm down, relax. I did pass the cop, and. He didn't pull me over, and I continued on my way. We ended up going to Wendover, and my grandmother was sat at literally one, one slot machine for the entire time that we were there. And she would come and report back to me that that the machine kept seizing up, and she talked to the manager, and the manager was assured her that there was nothing wrong with the machine. And and I was playing blackjack at the time; I hadn't started playing poker, but and finally. Um, you know, we had been there maybe five hours or so. She came to me. She kept saying, "It's, it's gonna hit. It's gonna hit, grandson. I know it's gonna hit." And sure enough, she came back to me at the table, and she was very excited that it actually had hit. I think she probably won about three hundred, maybe four hundred dollars in change. She was, she was, she was gambling with change. And she came back to、uh, when we came back to Salt Lake City. She gave. Literally every penny, <laughs> every penny to my children. So, my my oldest daughter and my and my middle daughter.、Uh, and I, you know that's a story that sticks in my mind. And the fact that my grandmother used to always fish and take my sister and I out to the lake or or a river. Or it, it was like a, probably a man-made body of water that. We would go to, and we would sit on the bank, and she would have her chair, and and she would fish. My grandmother loved to fish, and she always had. In fact, I've choked on fish bones a couple of times, and so I don't really like to eat fish if it has bones in it. For this very reason, but my grandmother would always have us have bread, so that if we did choke, we could swallow and wash it down. But that didn't work for me. But so ironically, as I sit and record this podcast. My uncle called and uh, and uh, video chatted with me, and he told me that that、uh, they had decided he and his siblings to, on my grandmother's birthday, take her ashes and put them in a lake, sprinkle them in a lake. So, my grandmother is basically going to become fish food. So, I love my grandmother to this day. She's a woman that I I, I respect her her opinion and the things that she did, but.、Uh, Rest in Pisces, grandmother. I love you. Although I didn't think too much of my grandmother's、uh, reaction to my passing the cop on the highway、uh, until ma- many years later, I did begin to think of 
uh, the sentiment that there was a discernible uh, expression of fear by my grandmother in that moment turns out to be something that uh, connects me to the story which we will discuss in this podcast today. Now I've seen the iconic Beatler photograph that depicts two boys hanging from a tree. And I'll admit, I, I really thought it was a scene somewhere from somewhere in the South, uh, you know, the deep South, the South being the area where lynchings occurred most often. The iconic photograph taken by Lawrence Beatler inspired Abel Mir- Mirapool to pen the poem Strange Fruit, which he later set to music. And it later became known or best known by the version sang by Billie Holiday. I've now since looked at the photograph, um, you know, a number of different times. I mean, it's really strange that the scene exists as it does. You see, I don't know, there's, I, I, I've counted, but, um, you know, I can only see maybe a handful, 14 people that you can specifically count. And these are the white people that are down in, in the crowd that have witnessed the lynching of Thomas Ship and Abraham Smith. Uh, but you can see off in the background and maybe you can see headlights of a car and and you can see faint telltale signs of people in the background and, and it seems as though there may be you know hundreds of people if you hear people talk about the story uh, the number of how many people are, are there or that were there it, it varies but you can also see that uh, and it looks like one of the one of the individuals, it's a gentleman or the boy on the right, um, and he's wrapped around, uh, wrapped around his waist like a, a towel. It doesn't look like he has pants on, like as if they've been ripped off and he doesn't have shoes on. And if you go close, you can see that there's blood on their shirts and, and their neck is, is, is cocked in a weird, in a weird way. I mean, it, it really is just looking at it as many times as I have and, and maybe the few times that some of you have seen, it just really is that image that that you just that just just tugs at your heart and your mind and your soul. And as it inspired the poem that Abel Mirapol wrote and inspired uh, the cover art for which you see on my podcast. But it, 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 it isn't, turns out it isn't a scene from the South, but rather a scene from Marion, Indiana, which turns out to be about 40 miles or so, or 40 minutes north, due north of Anderson, Indiana, the town in which I was born. Uh, and we'll see later on that there is a connection to Anderson, Indiana and Marion, Indiana, where this lynching occurred. Once again, I find myself having a connection to a lynching, which happens to be the last lynching that occurred in Indiana. Uh, what seems to be a very hot night in August 1930, August 6, 1930, Thomas Ship 18, Abraham Smith 19, and James Cameron 16 were hanging out just like people that age do, and they were playing uh, horseshoes. And Thomas Ship suggests to the group that they hold some stick-ups to get some extra money. Now, the plan was to go to an area in Marion, Indiana, uh, in town called Lover's Lane. Uh, when I was growing up, Lover's Lane is what we called uh, watching the submarine races. If you can imagine how a submarine travels, usually, and if you're watching that race, then I think you get the point. They were going to go and, and uh, find someone in Lover's Lane who they could uh, stick up. James Cameron wasn't too down for this uh for this plan at all, but uh, they convinced him, Thomas Ship and Abraham Smith convinced them to go down with them to, to hold this stick up. So he originally has the gun and he, he and uh, Thomas Ship and Abraham Smith find two individuals in a car by the name of Claude Dieter, who was 23, and Mary Ball, who was 18 at the time. Cameron uh, opens the door and tells him to st- stick him up. It's at this point that Cameron recognizes Claude Dieter. Now, Claude Dieter had been a customer of his, James Cameron uh, Shine Shoes, and uh, he thought 
kind of highly of Claude Dieter. And in fact, he thought that he was a good tipper and they were friends. And he, he even said in an interview that he considered him a friend. I go up to the car and I open the car door and I held the gun up like this and I said, stick him up. And this man and this lady got out of the car, this white man and this white lady. When the guy got out of the car, I looked at him and you know what? He was a friend of mine. He was a nice white fella. We used to come down to a place where I shine shoes and he'd tip me and we'd always laugh and talk. And, and the young lady got out of the car. Her face was so pale and lovely and frightened. And I gave the gun back to Tommy and I said, here, you guys take this gun. I said, I'm not gonna have anything to do with you guys. And I left him out there at the scene of the crime. I kept on running until I got home, a distance of about six miles. As he was headed out, he did hear gunshots, bang, bang, bang. And um, he didn't turn back around because he really didn't want to find out who it was that uh, was doing the shooting. He just knew that he probably was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So he did, in, in fact, head back to his mother's house. At this time, two black men riding around in this small Marion town, Marion, Indiana, and also someone having witnessed or heard the crime and went uh, down to check it out, you know, and seeing that one Mary Ball was, uh, you know, claiming to have been raped, allegedly, and that Dieter uh, had been shot three times, as I said. It didn't take very long for the sheriff, Jacob Campbell, in fact, to round up these two gentlemen who were riding around in a car. So they were they were captured fairly quickly. They were taken down to the jail, and they named Cameron as the shooter. So Harley Burden, this officer, the only black officer on the Marion, Indiana police force, found Cameron at his mother's house and took him into custody. That was the first time in my life I ever prayed for white people that I can consciously remember. You know what I prayed for? I prayed that that man wouldn't die so he could say I hadn't shot him. Around this time when uh, James Cameron, Tommy Schiff, and Abraham Smith were in jail, obviously uh, the word had gotten around town that Dieter had been shot three times and also that the rape of Mary Ball had occurred. Now, Mary Ball's, Mary Ball's father uh, was part of the mob, if you will, that was beginning to be gathered around the town once word got around that Mary Ball had been raped. Now, I don't know if, uh, and this seems to be uh, a thing that's happened in the past uh, or around this time, that rape the rape of a white woman was this atrocious crime. And usually uh, it was something that, um, that ended in, in a lynching. I don't know if it was necessarily that Dieter had been shot. In fact, he lingered for about uh, 11 or 12 hours and uh, his family was by his side. He was a Quaker. He was a religious person. His family was religious and he apparently, you know, made his peace with God. He actually ended up dying, you know, us, like I said, like 11 or 12 hours later. But by the time that this has happened, by the time he has died, there was a huge uh, crowd that had gathered around the uh, jail. And it's interesting, uh, there are a couple of interviews that have happened where James Cameron talks about how he could hear this crowd and, and also see from his window this crowd that had been gathering from early on in the morning till, you know, the time when the lynching, at least, was about to occur. Yeah, the crowd was beginning to gather as soon as we were put in jail. And by morning, uh, they were cluttering up the jail yard and all that day, they kept coming. And by, by nightfall, there was 10 to 15,000 whites out there screaming for the blood of us three blacks. The crowd had begun to, to gather. Now, what I find is interesting is that a lot of people talk about whether or not it was the fact that, James, or that Claude Dieter was shot or if it was that Mary Ball uh, was raped. But it seems like the crowd was gathering and there was talk around the town that there was going to be a lynching um, because of this this crime that had occurred. It was it became very evident that something was going to happen. In fact, um, there was a number of calls made by uh, a lady by the name of Catherine, uh, nicknamed Flossie Bailey. So 
Catherine uh, and a bunch of the black people that were in the town, in fact, fled from the area because of this talk around the town of of a lynching that was going to happen. Uh, Someone in the jail at some point in time after Dieter had died hung his bloody shirt outside of a window. Now, that's kind of a flag or maybe some kind of message, but uh, once this happened, I think is when things kind of amped up and the crowd began to be uh, very agitated. And in fact, they began demanding uh, that that they have the, the boys. So Thomas Shipp, Abraham Smith, and James Cameron. The crowd began taking sledgehammers and began trying to break down the walls to the prison. I always find it interesting that you have an, an incident where there was a crime. There's no question that there was a crime. Now, arguably, James Cameron, he says that he was he ran away from the scene. He didn't have any part of this uh, this whole ordeal, including allegedly raping uh, Mary Ball and and or shooting uh, Claude Dieter. But these men are already in custody. Just common sense or or just uh, common decency, if you will, would dictate that if there is going to be something that should be done, it was already going to be done because they were in jail. Now, we would expect that, um, you know, in our system, even today, although we both, we all know that this doesn't necessarily happen, they would be tried by a jury of their peers and uh, and then they would be sentenced or convicted if they, in fact, were found to be guilty. But the crowd um, had something different in mind. In fact, this being the case, this is the whole thing about lynching, is that justice is not served just because um, you feel that uh, an eye for an eye is kind of what uh, these people are saying with their own judgment in place. So the mob, um, again, a very big mob, begins to work on breaking down the doors to the jail. So they eventually get through the jail. And of course, the, the, the officers that were on duty um, apparently had nothing to do with them breaking in or stopping them or trying to stop them. They weren't going to shoot into the crowd because, again, there were men, women, and children. But they do get in, and they take out first Thomas Ship. He was taken to the, to the courthouse square, and he was actually hanged from the bars of one of the jailhouse windows. Long before he appears on the tree in the picture, Beatler's picture, do we have him beaten uh, and dead. And then, second, they came for Smith. Now, Smith, um, in one of the accountings, bit one of the individuals on the hand, or maybe on his arm. And uh, in order to, to loosen it up, someone took a crowbar and hit him in his, in his jaw to loosen his bite. And after he was on the branch, they drug Thomas Ship and hung him as well, but he was already dead. And as they had Smith, uh, the gentleman or the boy on the right, as you look at the picture, so you have Thomas Ship on the left, and then you have Abraham Smith on the right. Uh, it's been said that he was able to grab the rope and try to keep it from choking him while he was up there. And they actually let him back down, broke both of his arms, and strung him back up again. And again, you see him on, in the picture with uh, his pants were off, no shoes on. He's, you, can, you can actually see in this black and white picture that, that he's visibly damaged. I mean, you know, they, they've hurt him and killed him. Um, so this is the image that you see. Now, after Thomas Shipp and Abraham Smith are hanging from the tree, the crowd comes back and is looking for James Cameron. They came in, and they opened the door, and they said, James Cameron, come forward. Well, James Cameron wasn't about to come forward after I'd seen what they'd done to Tommy and Abe. So at that precise moment, the sheriff came up, and he looked at me, and he looked at this other black boy, and he looked at that mob leader, and he said, these are nothing but boys. He said, besides, Cameron ain't in here. So you done hung two of them, so that ought to satisfy you. Then he turned around, and he went back downstairs. And when he went back downstairs, the uh, the crowd said, Cameron is in there, and said, we want him. And then they began to chant for me like a football player. We want Cameron, we want Cameron, we want Cameron. And I thought I would die. I felt like I was in a rubber suit, and ice was packed all around me. I just felt cold and chilled. Nothing could warm me. 
the mob turned around, went back upstairs. They said, all right, Cameron's in here and said, if we don't get him, we're going to link every goddamn one of you niggas. And when they said that, half of the blacks in there fell down on their hands and knees and started to crawl around like trained animals. And they were hugging the pant legs of the mobsters and kissing their hands and saying, Mr. White folks, please don't link us. We ain't nothing but a bunch of poor old niggas in here with train riding. That boy ain't in here, honestly. He now, they knew I was in there, but they were trying to save me. And this goes on until all the human endurance left in the bodies of those black men had been exhausted. Those crawling around on the floor. And one of them raised his hand. He said, there he is, Mr. White folks. It wasn't us, that's him. And then the mob closed in on me and they started beating me. But they too put around his neck a noose. So tight in fact that as they're beating him and dragging him toward uh, the same area that his, his friends, he calls them his buddies and he refers to him actually as Tommy and, and Abe. They are taking him to this tree. But he describes that he hears a voice, uh, a voice that he says is, is lovely and sweet that says, let him go. He has nothing. He had nothing to do with this, uh, with with this rape or this or this murder. And somehow, some way, out of the craziness of this whole entire mob scene, this lynching scene, that his life was spared. James Cameron is arguably the only person who has survived a lynching. Flossie Bailey pushed for the lynchers to be brought to trial. Everyone who saw this or saw that this had happened knew that it was going to be a difficult trial to, 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 to take the court. There was eventually an all-white, all-male uh, jury which actually found the two people that were tried, uh, they found them not guilty. And she was also instrumental in uh, getting some prominent lawyers from out of state or from out of town to put together a defense for James Cameron. So James Cameron actually was convicted of accessory to this crime. So uh, they convinced an, an all-white jury that Cameron was only the an accessory to Dieter's murder, and this resulted in a sentence of 2 to 21 years. He actually only served four years. Miss Catherine Flossie Bailey for your work in speaking out publicly, giving freedom of voice with regards to this atrocity and having the opinion that it was wrong and that there was still work to do, I personally want to thank you for your service. And I know uh, we as people, as black people, as a nation, are appreciative of the work which you did. So again, thank you for your service. Walter Francis White, the head of the NAACP at the time, was also involved in... Uh, the case of the lynchings of Abe Smith and Thomas Schiff. Uh, Walter White actually was an interesting man because he was an individual who at the time was able to accomplish what they called passing. Or, so he was very fair skinned, he had blue eyes and he uh, had blonde hair. He looked like a white man, but he was in fact black. He wrote a book entitled a man called white where he says i am a negro my skin is white my eyes are blue my hair is blonde the traits of my race are nowhere visible on me catherine flossie bailey and him together devised a plan where he would go into marion indiana and investigate and he was able to do this on a number of different uh, lynchings in fact he says i investigate lynchings. So he was able to infiltrate the town and talk to the people who were heavily KKK influenced and he actually came up with a list of suspects that were identified on some level and he presented this this information, his, his investigation. So Walter Francis White, for your part in attempting to bring to justice the individuals responsible for the lynchings of Abe Smith and Tommy Ship, uh, I personally want to thank you for your service. The Dieters, Grace and William Dieter, the parents of Claude Dieter, uh, had some part after the fact in trying to give freedom of voice. Based on their religious beliefs, they wanted their son to forgive his attackers. In fact, 
Dieter's mother reached out to the parents of Abe Smith and Tom Ship, it's it said, and they also attempted to get to the Marion newspaper to publish Claude's account of the attack, which actually uh, seemed to refute the claims that Mary Ball had of, of her rape. It turns out that the paper did not print this story, and they didn't even print the fact that they were opposed to the lynching in general. But ultimately, you know, they led a, a life thereafter without their son, the eldest of eight, and they, they suffered um, because of the events. But on some level, they tried to, again, give freedom of voice. So to the Dieters, I say thank you for your service. My father, Edgar M. Woodall, pastor of Friendship Missionary Baptist Church in Anderson, Indiana, and my mother, Linda Y. Woodall, a Navy veteran of 14 years, who, although they divorced when I was a very young age, collectively put together a plan to raise my sister and I in a manner that would have us be citizens that contribute to society. Thank you both for your service. And finally, the individual who embodies this story, who survived this terrible event, the lynching of Abraham Smith and Thomas Shipp, Dr. James Cameron, that title imparted to him or given to him uh, by the University of Milwaukee. He led a, a full life and died at the age of 92, having been married for 68 years to his wife, Virginia. He, he did a number of things that contributed to America as a, as a society. He raised five college-educated children. He was a devout Catholic. He served as Indiana's director of civil liberties. And he worked at Delco Remy before he left to uh, Milwaukee, the very same factory my father worked and retired from in Anderson, Indiana. Dr. James Cameron also founded the America's Black Holocaust Museum in in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and countless numbers of people were able to be educated because of his story. And there are interviews and videos and footage of him actually talking to children. And he he indicated that he didn't think it was too soon for children to be exposed to the story that he had to tell. He participated in civil rights marches against the, the KKK. He was an honorary guest where 80 senators passed a resolution apologizing for never outlawing the practice of lynching. He received an official pardon from the governor of Indiana and the Indiana Parole Board before he died. So to you, Dr. James Cameron, thank you for your service. I visited my father in Anderson, Indiana around Christmas time, just before Christmas time, and I discovered that Marion, Indiana was not very far away from Anderson. Um, You know, as I mentioned in the story, that is the case. It's about took us about 40 minutes drive headed north from Anderson, Indiana. While I was there, you know, things have changed since 1930, obviously, but I was looking for some kind of memorial, if you will, or recognition of the incident that occurred at this courthouse, and apparently the jail uh, was, you know, adjacent or kitty corner to this particular building, which is different from what it was back in 1930. I didn't see anything that told the story of that uh, the incident that happened or anything like that. But what I did find was uh, a number of memorials that were erected to, to honor various acts of service, various branches during different conflicts, whether it be current conflicts that we have now, Korea War, Vietnam War, World, World War I or World War II, etc. It basically is the reason why I named this episode, Thank You for Your Service. The people involved in this case did things I, I, would, I think are, are honorable, and so I thank them for their service, and the fact that, that, they, that uh, this courthouse or the city of uh, Marion has decided that that's what they were going to honor. Those, those two are deserving. I served in the military for six years, the Air Force, and so I am... Uh, grateful when people say to me thank you for your service and I do the same I just thought it was interesting that this incident wasn't recognized and I think that I've come to understand that 
There is obviously some pain that goes into uh, reliving this or rehashing this this incident, and the families that uh, still exist that are connected to any of the people that were involved or any of the people that were related to the victims, they haven't yet determined how it is that they want to recognize or honor this this incident. So it's not that I, I, I am putting the, the action down or inaction, if you will, down. I'm just, it was just something, something that simply, you know, came to my attention and I, I became aware of it. So um, that is the story of the lynching which occurred in Marion, Indiana on August 7th, 1930, involving uh, Thomas Shipp and Abraham Smith, and then James Cameron, who went on to live a very full life and contributed significantly to the betterment of our nation. Just prior to uh, me sitting down and recording this episode, um, I'm talking about sometime last week, we received the shocking news that Kobe Bryant and his daughter and a number of other people lost their lives in the helicopter crash. Now, I personally have never been faced with death in a moment where there's time for you to to suck it all in, so to speak, or to take it all in. I am I'm a Utah Jazz fan and on some level an, an Indiana uh, Indianapolis Pacers fan because that's where I was born. But as a person, I believe that Kobe Bryant became a, a very a very good man and above all he was a father I'm a father of three children three daughters and I can only hope and imagine that in the moments that he was about to go down that he was able to hold his his daughter and tell her he loved her and be all right as he was going to see his maker and I know that Cameron Dr. James Cameron spent the rest of his life after this incident contributing to making his world a better place. And so I thank him for his service. I thank anyone who allows freedom to have a voice so that this never happens again. I want to thank all of you for supporting this podcast. It was, you know, a dream for me to sit down and and say I'm going to do this on this subject. I know it's a difficult subject to talk about, but as as many years as it took to to ingrain in the, the minds of people that would do this and think it something that should be done, I think it's it takes just as long, if not longer, to make sure that we undo that damage and prepare our our children and our children's children to have a mindset that will simply make it nearly impossible for something like this to happen again. This is why I'm doing this podcast. This is why uh, I sit before this mic and I talk to you guys about these stories. And I do have some connection on some level to the ones that I pick. It's not always going to be black people because there were white people that were involved. And in fact, the next case will be that which occurred in California, and it was a white man. It was two white men, actually. So please continue to listen. Please continue to like and share. Um, I do appreciate when, when those of you who have reached out to me and tell me the things that you like and dislike, I am working hard to make sure that I bring the type of stories and the type of content that will allow you to spend the 30 or so minutes that I stand before this mic and tell you the stories of the men and women that were lynched in the States of America. God bless the United States of America and God bless all of you.